We'll take a uh, short digression into the subject of load balancing. And if you picture a server farm or you know, some other sort of distributed uh, application, we have uh, N servers, all of which are responsible for handling incoming requests. And we can assume that all the servers are the same or at least close enough that there are no differences that really matter. We typically see in load balancing some assignment of tasks via a dispatcher of some sort. Uh, it, you can do this yourself. Um, web cloud services providers offer you tools that you know, automatically balance requests, blah, 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 and with you know, connection keep alives and stuff. So the same uh, clients get matched with the same servers in case there's some internal state. You know, that kind of thing um, does exist uh, you know, already. So usually what we see is, you know, an incoming request goes to a uh, dispatcher and the dispatcher is then going to just assign it uh, to a different host. Okay, um, simple. The um, thing is that there's no um, strong rules about how load balancing should work. Um, it's possible to do after the fact assignment. Uh, we might call that work stealing, um, which is you know, clients monitor or hosts, I should say, monitor their queue. Uh, and if they find it's running low, they can go take work from somebody else's queue, something like that. But there are a few different assignment policies if we're doing upfront assignment, uh, and uh, they're all listed here. First one is random. That is exactly what it sounds like. The load balancer chooses a random server and says, yep, yours, take it. Um, that's, well, I mean, it, it's not a bad strategy. You know, if your randomness is sufficiently random, then you know things get handed out somewhat evenly. Uh, and, uh, you know, it can work. Next one is round robin, uh, which is uh, job I goes to host I modulo N, N being the number of servers that you have, so I'm always just, in fairness, hand it out in this order, uh, and that's it. There's no, uh, there's no debate, there's no uh, consideration of how busy or not busy a, uh, uh, a server is. You just take it and give it to whichever one whose turn it is. Shortest queue. The job is assigned to the server whose queue is currently the shortest. Uh, that obviously requires uh, a little bit more work than either of the previous strategies on the part of the load balancer, uh, because the load balancer now has to look at the queues uh, of each server and figure out which one is the shortest and then assign it accordingly. In the previous strategies, didn't have to know anything about them, just, you know, hey, you know, I'm giving you some work, thanks, bye. <laughs> uh, now we have to actually, you know, pay attention to it. Size interval task assignment. Uh, this is assigning different jobs to different servers based on the estimated size of the job. So short jobs go to one server, medium to another, long to another. For example, um, grocery store works a little bit like this, uh, where you have you know the express lane, where if you know you have. 12 items or fewer, then you can go to the express lane. Uh, and that would be a form of assignment based on job size. In, in this case, there's only two sizes. You know, you have 12 items or fewer, or you have more than that. Um, and uh, then you, you go to a different queue. Um, I mean, if you go to the wrong one, uh, you know, if you have fewer items and you go to the wrong one, it's no big deal. If you have more items and you go to the short uh, queue, uh, people might look at you a little bit funny and you might feel bad. Um, but uh, you know, it, it usually doesn't end the world. Uh, least work left. Um, so a job goes to the server that has the least total remaining work, where work is the sum of the size of the jobs. So this again requires knowing uh, a bit about what the queue state looks like for each server. Uh, and in this case, it's not just the number of jobs, but also the length. If it's possible to estimate that in the beginning, then that could be helpful. You know, having 10 jobs that are super short, uh, you know, in the shortest queue version might mean you're not chosen. But um, on the other hand, you know, making uh, a job get in line behind one job that is super long might actually be worse for that job that's waiting. Uh, and then there is central queue, which is instead of actually doing active load balancing, uh, you know, being assigned directly to a host when a server needs work to do, uh, everything goes in a central queue and jobs are taken from that central queue uh, when a server needs some work to do. The central queue model actually isn't necessarily wrong. Um, it just, um, it just uh, prevents uh, some... 
uh, parallelization because we have you know, a single queue that is going to be uh, eventually a bottleneck for uh, all of the servers that are trying to uh, work. Uh, and taking things out of the central queue does balance the load, but at a cost of you know, introducing single point of failure uh, and uh, seeing to it that you know, this uh, queue is our uh, bottleneck in the system, most likely. You might be thinking, um, which of those is the best? Which leads the lowest mean response time? I think, uh, at least at the time when uh, I was writing this, nobody actually knows. There hasn't been enough research into this to give a definitive answer where I could say, yes, uh, you know, it is the case that this is the best strategy. We can speculate that it very likely depends on things like job variability and you know, other factors, you know, how many servers do we have and uh, what are they all the same, that kind of thing. There, there isn't necessarily you know, an obvious answer where I can say for sure. Uh, this is the factor that it depends on. So if you uh, find yourself, for whatever reason, really into queuing theory, and you can say to yourself, you know, I want to do a PhD on this subject, um, you know, this is an opportunity. It hasn't been well studied, uh, and there is room for research in this area, if that's something that appeals to you. In, in the words of Kenny Loggins, you never say hello to you until you get it on the red line overload. You never know what you can do until you get it as high as you can go. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you haven't seen Top Gun, uh, there's a sequel that's coming out soon, I believe. Uh, but if you haven't seen the original Top Gun, um, I'm not saying you should, um, but maybe you should watch the honest trailers about the original Top Gun. Um, admittedly, it's a little bit um, not safe for work, um, and uh, maybe uh, maybe I can't like show it in class, kind of thing. Um, but I think you should. Um, I think you should watch it. I think it's hilarious, and I think it tells you everything you need to know uh, about that movie and uh, you know uh, Highway to the Danger Zone. Okay. Um, yeah, so earlier I mentioned uh, it would probably be bad to see six jobs arriving per second to a system that can handle five per second. That doesn't seem like rocket science, uh, but it does bear repeating, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the subject uh, at least a little bit here. Um, usually when we talk about um, our uh, systems that we're going to evaluate, we require that lambda is less than or equal to mu, uh, and in fact assume that it is strictly less than. That is to say, we are not overloaded. The systems that we are looking at uh, are not you know, horribly overloaded by way too much work. As an engineering student, you may be amused by the idea that you may one day not be completely overloaded with work. I want you to remember that the values for lambda and mu are averages, so it could happen that we temporarily fall behind a bit because we're arriving faster than we're processing, but we'll make up for it a little bit later on when we eventually catch up. Right, we, or um, the alternative scenario is we temporarily get ahead uh, and the queues are all empty before more work gets piled on. Either of those could happen, but we're interested in the long term. Uh, and in the long term, you know, we have to be um, keeping up, otherwise things get out of hand. Uh, and uh, if we're not keeping up, if arrivals are exceeding completion, then in the long run, we end up you know, with a queue length of infinity. Uh, right you now take the limit as time goes to infinity the queue length goes to infinity and obviously that won't work so the uh, people won't wait forever first of all um, but second of all you know you can't store the infinite queue length anywhere because uh, there's there's just not enough space uh, and so if you wanted um, a little uh, mathematical uh, justification behind that will represent time with its traditional symbol t uh, and define n of t as the number of jobs in the system at time t. Uh, a of t represents arrivals by time t and d of t departures by time t, uh, in which case the expected value uh, of the uh, n of t uh, is equal to expected value of a of t minus expected value of d of t, um, which is to say that you know, the number of jobs in the system on average is the average number of arrivals minus the average number of departures. So if 500 jobs have arrived and 480 have departed, our number of jobs in the system is 20. No, uh, no magic there, uh, uh, which is to say that lambda t uh, minus mu of t 
uh, is the relevant factor here, which is t times lambda minus mu, uh, which is to say if arrivals exceed departures, lambda minus mu is a positive number and not a negative number, uh, which means that this term goes to infinity as time goes to infinity, which we do not want. Okay. Um, so raising our throughput is generally desirable. This is the kind of thing that we've really been talking about for the entire course when we say, all right, we are, we are doing programming for performance and we are parallelizing this algorithm, uh, which increases our bandwidth, you know, we're increasing our throughput. Same thing if we reduce latency, we said, all right, we replace this with you know, a different implementation that is better and has lower latency and you know, completes in less time. The faster we complete work, the more work we can get done in the same amount of time. And improving that is usually a goal. Um, however, improving the service rate does not necessarily improve the throughput. You might be thinking like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Okay, we've assumed that the arrival rate is less than the service rate. So we have already enough capacity to complete incoming work and possibly at least a little bit more. Um, and so the limiting factor on how much work is completed in total is actually the work that is arriving. Adding more work capacity doesn't necessarily mean that more work gets done. You might be capable of completing six assignments for this class this term, but you're mercifully only assigned four of them. Uh, and then you will only complete four. Uh, raising your work capacity, you know, increasing your ability to get work done is good you know, in terms of uh, you know, what is possible, but adding that capacity on its own doesn't accomplish anything if there isn't more work to do. So raising mu increases the maximum possible throughput. You could complete six assignments, but I only assigned you four, so you only complete four. So the actual throughput at the end of the term, how many assignments did you complete? Still four. Doesn't matter that you could have done six, uh, or if your capacity was four, or five, or seven, or 12. Uh, I don't know if 12 is realistic, but uh, anything like that increases the maximum possible throughput, but not the necessarily the actual throughput. But just to make you suffer, in a closed system, that's not the case, uh, where there's always more work to do, and as soon as one item is finished, the next one enters the queue. You know, pic picture you're, uh, you're doing, I don't know, a sprint, and every time a ticket is completed in the sprint, a new one gets added to the sprint. Um, in which case, um, you are always running at capacity all the time, uh, in which case uh, mu is the controlling factor uh, because your throughput is exactly equal to your service rate. However many things you are capable of getting done, that's how many you get done. You know, we have 500 million transactions to process, and if we can do five at a time, we're doing five at a time, and that's our um, throughput. If we increase it to 10, then we're doing 10 at a time, and that's our throughput. We like that. Um, that's the case in, you know, the batch system, you know, the mainframe kind of thing where you submit your job and it runs overnight, and in the morning you get a result. Maybe it's the one you wanted. So in that case, you're running at capacity all the time. Um, queuing theory is not super intuitive, as you may imagine at this point. And... Uh, well, truthfully, uh, closed systems somehow are worse than uh, open systems in this regard. Uh, what is the throughput here in the diagram that is shown? Uh, we have uh, a multiprocessing level of N, uh, where we have a uh, two stages kind of processing where uh, a particular job goes through uh, server one, which has completion rate mu one. Uh, and then it goes after that into the queue for server 2, mu2, two, uh, as its completion rate. And then when a job is done, the next one is immediately dispatched based on uh, n. Okay. Intuition might suggest that it is the minimum uh, of mu1 and mu2. Um, and the answer to that is sometimes. This is valid if the slower of the two servers, whichever one it is, is always busy. But that might not actually always be the case. 
Um, if if multi-programming level is one, there's only one job you know, running at a time, um, maybe, uh, I mean, yeah, you could argue, I suppose, that in that case, yes, it's always the limiting factor is the slower server. Um, but you know, having only one job in progress at a time is kind of inefficient because you're only using one of the two servers at a time anyway uh, and, and end up feeling maybe a little bit silly. Um, what about n is 2? Um, you know, does that mean the slower server always has work to do at all times? The answer to that is unfortunately no. Um, you know, the thing that really you know, trips us up in this regard is that when we talk about these things, they are averages. Um, and so you know, sometimes the slow server is faster and sometimes the fast server is the slow one because these are just averages and it really depends on what work it is you have to do. Averages can be misleading. You know, uh, if you read, you know, the average family might have 2.3 children or whatever the figure is, you know, different by country. Um, but you can't have 0 0.3 of a child um, that I know of. Uh, so it is ultimately the case that uh, when we talk about averages and we say, all right, this is the slow server, it means that most of the time it is slower, but it's not all of the time. So anyway, if you want to um, measure your you know, maximum capacity here, your uh, completion rate mu, um, you can um, try to figure out how to get this done. Some smart folks at IBM wanted to know that if given an arrival rate lambda, uh, what the mean job size is, which is the expected value of S, uh, which is one over mu. Um, and um, that is, well, you know, it's, well, it's one over mu, so it's a way you can compute it indirectly. Uh, e of S is the mean time uh, required for a job in isolation. So the experiment in this case would be 100 runs of sending in a job and waiting for the result and then averaging the time that it took. That's okay, but it doesn't reflect the reality where you have things like data being cached uh, and uh, possible multiple concurrent jobs and competing over resources and stuff like that. So that's not um, that's not super representative of what happens in a real life scenario. So if you have an open system, um, then you just keep ramping up Lambda. You just keep piling more jobs on the system, and at some point the system can't keep up, and the queue starts growing indefinitely, and we're not keeping up, uh, and the completion rate levels off at some point, and that gives us immediately a value for mu. If you are unable to, despite the system being way overloaded, complete more than you know, 200 jobs per minute, you know that's your completion rate, and you're done. Uh, in the closed system strategy, that doesn't really work uh, because you've set it up so there's always work to do. Uh, and in closed systems, there's sometimes consideration given to think time. Uh, and think time is what happens when you know the user is at the command line saying, you know, actually, I want to send this in to get compiled. So they have to spend a couple of minutes changing some lines of code uh, so that you know, they can send it in. And, oh, I forgot a semicolon on line 200. You know, all right, all right, that should be fixed now. That is usually represented as think time in a closed system uh, and what we're actually going to do is make a stress test where there isn't any of that uh, in which case there's no think time we just keep sending in work all the time just keep compiling the same thing over and over and over again uh, and then you just uh, measure the uh, jobs completing per second which gives you the value of mu directly now, how long does it take to compile this code I don't know, you keep submitting it, uh, and eventually you get an answer. Uh, and when you have your answer, you don't really need anything else. You've got the answer right there. You don't have to do any conversion of that value. So hopefully this has been a uh, reasonable introduction to queuing theory, uh, give you some definition of the terms, and introduce you to the kinds of problem that it can solve, uh, as well as the kinds of problems that we're going to face when we try to work with it. Uh, in the next topic, we are uh, going to start off by you know, recapping some things uh, about probability, uh, but also go into um, some of the properties of systems that we will analyze so that we have a good basis for making our predictions. Uh, and then the uh, next and final part about queuing theory, uh, we'll talk about, all right, given what we know, how do we apply it to solving some practical problems? So there's a fair amount of setup um, for that payoff.